Will and King uh, for ME CFS Alert. Today we come to you from the Newton Wellesley Hospital in Massachusetts. It has been the site of the annual meeting of the Massachusetts ME CFS and Fibromyalgia Association. The star speaker has been somebody I have admired for many years, David Tuller. David, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for having I want to tell you, I think of you as a dragon slayer. The dragon that you have slayed, or maybe brought down, <laughs> uh, uh, is the PACE trials, which were such a diversion in this business of finding a cure, right. in that these trials set up in England by essentially the British establishment, medical establishment, with five million pounds, which is somewhere between seven and nine million, no, seven and eight. Depending upon the current exchange rate. Uh, yeah, eight million dollars, a serious trial, over 600 people, and yet very flawed and with very strange conclusions. Essentially the conclusion that, uh, that graduated exercise should be part of the uh, kill and that the, the, the disease is primarily psychosomatic that it belongs to psychiatrists, not to clinicians. Something like that. They didn't really determine that it was, the, the, the findings were that uh, graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavior therapy, as they uh, developed it, were uh, effective treatments and some people would recover. Um, they didn't actually call it a psychosomatic illness. However, they did, the basis for the treatments was that people were having unhelpful illness beliefs and needed to be alleviated of those unhelpful illness beliefs and that uh, it was based on you know, people thinking they were had an organic illness and that they were then resting too much and were getting very deconditioned and therefore needed um, to get back to their normal lives or to have a graded exercise program uh, that would get them better. And it was a completely ridiculous theory uh, and the treatments uh, didn't work according to their own initial uh, what they promised to do in their protocol, but they changed all the outcome, the main outcome measures and came up with findings that they thought were more attractive. And then these findings were published in the Lancet, which is, I believe, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, or the sort of bias within New England or right. medicine. Um, but it's right up there. It's taken terribly seriously around right. the globe. It's supposed to be seriously peer-reviewed. They're supposed to be able to stand behind what they've published. What was your experience with the Lancet? Well, they have stood behind what they've published. It's just unfortunate that what they published was a piece of garbage. My experience is that they refuse to acknowledge basic flaws in the study that are obvious to any first-year epidemiology student. The PACE trial is now used in epidemiology courses at Berkeley as a case study of terrible science. Uh, a well-known biostatistician at Columbia who called the PACE trial in my initial uh, investigation um, the height of clinical trial amateurism. He just gave a talk at Columbia a month or so ago uh, called How Not to Conduct a Clinical Trial with PACE as the prime example. There are so many flaws in the study that it's preposterous that it ever passed peer review. Um, we don't really know what the peer review process was. Richard Horton, uh, the editor of The Lancet, claimed in an interview that it went through endless rounds of peer review, but we also know that it was fast-tracked to publication, which probably means within a month, uh, although we don't actually know how long that took, because The Lancet's been really mum about their peer review process in this case. So uh, we do know that a lot of these studies and the earlier studies um, have tended to be reviewed probably by the same, you know, peer-reviewed by the same group of people who routinely cite themselves and cite their own studies. And so it's basically a kind of a group of people talking to themselves but exerting their influence on the rest of the world. You have described Britain as a culture of deference. Yeah. I could not argue with that and I have some knowledge of Britain. Um, how did that affect the study? They closed ranks behind it? I think basically what happened with this study was that it was set up as the quote definitive study of the two treatments that had already sort of become the de facto standard of care in the UK and also elsewhere. And so it, it was based, it was piggybacking on smaller studies that had been done by a similar, the same group of people, which purported to also show that these two treatments, cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise therapy, were effective in helping people improve. The problem, the main 
design problem with these studies is that they're unblinded, so everybody knows what treatment they're getting. And the outcome measures that they relied on were subjective. So basically, it's just people saying, I feel better or I feel less fatigued, rather than any objective criteria. In the PACE trial, they had several objective criteria that failed to match the subjective claims of success. So those were how far people walked, uh, how fit they were on like a, a test uh, up and down on a step stool. Step stool. Um, did people get back to work? Uh, did people uh, get off benefits? So nobody from the treatments, you know, those, those uh, objective measures, none of them actually uh, supported the subjective findings of improvement. Instead of actually then questioning whether that might mean something's wrong or that the subjective measures were not actually, uh, you know, were, were subjective and not valid, they sort of basically discounted their objective measures as not objective after all and sort of didn't pay much attention to them. I remember reading somewhere that you had written uh, to the organizers offering at your own expense to go to Britain and explain the deficiencies in the study as the argument ramped up or as you became more and more effective in criticizing the study. But it must have been very difficult for a lone reporter, an American from San Francisco, to go up against the British medical establishment? It really wasn't. Um, I think it was more difficult for them than for me. I was perfectly happy to do it. Um, I, uh, what I probably said was that I, I, I spent a year looking into it. I went to England during the, you know, for about a, a month, uh, first to interview patients. Um, when I tried to talk to the Pace, to the Pace authors and to the Lancet, I offered to come back to England and talk to them. So yeah, I did it on my own. I mean, I had backing from my faculty colleagues, you know, moral backing, but I had no institutional support and or financial backing. I just did it on my own uh, because I could. Uh, I had, a, you know, a half-time position at Berkeley, which was covering, you know, I was getting salary and benefits, and I had, uh, you know, freelance work, and I had the resources to be able to do that, and it was interesting to me. And so it wasn't difficult. Um, I was, you know, I figured. I mean, if I was wrong, I could have been sued, but I wasn't worried about being wrong because I knew I was right. Were you able to call up, you've done a lot of work for the New York Times, and before that you were a, a reporter, a staff reporter at right. the San Francisco Chronicle. Were you able to call up people and say, this is David Tuller from the New York Times? Or? No, because I could say I, I wasn't from the New York Times. I never represented myself. You know, I mean, if I had been still on the staff at the Chronicle, I could have said I'm yeah, you know, the Chronicle. I just called them and said no. I mean, my, my calling card was that I was had an academic position at Berkeley. Okay. So um, I was contacting them, uh, you know, with my, ac you know, from my academic side, uh, and at the time I was contacting them, I already had a doctorate from Berkeley in public health. Um, so I was able to say, you know, this is, you know, I mean, I don't use my doctor title particularly, but I was able to sort of approach them as a doctor, uh, given that I had a doctorate. So. Um, you know, but but they were not interested in talking to me. They refused my my request that I uh, come to London. Richard Horton, the Lancet editor, did not agree to meet with me. So I, you know, wrote it without their responses. Then after it was published, they complained to uh, <laughs> uh, my colleague, Professor Rockinello of Columbia, on whose site Virology blog I published it, that I hadn't given them a chance to respond. Uh, beforehand, and I was like, "What are you talking about? I gave you a chance to respond, but it turned out that they meant that I hadn't shown it to them in advance so they could comment." And I was like, "Why would I do that? I mean, why would I show it to you in advance to comment? You had a chance to talk to me, and you didn't. That was your opportunity." So they sent in their response. We posted it. Their response was ridiculous. They basically claimed it was all misinformation and all this, but all they didn't like was my interpretation of the facts. The facts speak for themselves. The study is a piece of garbage. But because it was Britain, and we have some, we have some deference to British institutions, we Americans, right. uh, and because it was new, it influenced American institutions, did it not, like the Mayo Clinic? Really. Well, yes, the, the study was very influential. Um, the authors, uh, or some of the, a couple of the authors and then others involved in this kind of domain of research had consulted with the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S., you know, in the 90s, long before the PACE trial was published. And then, and had influenced the U.S. approach to it. And then, when the Pace trial was published, it kind of ratified what people thought they knew, because they manipulated their data in a way that allowed them to produce more attractive-looking results. So, 
It influenced the Centers for Disease Control. It influenced the treatments that were offered at places like Kaiser Permanente and Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic and other major uh, university or other major academic cent and clinic I mean, treatment centers. Um, so it had a huge impact in US, UK, Australia, you know, all throughout Europe and so on. So it's been a very influential study. I want to ask you, change gears here, I want to ask you about the Royal Free Hospital and the outbreak of MECFS there in 1955, okay. which is where the term myalgic encephalomyelitis was first coined or first used, right. uh, but which is also the first large outbreak that we deal with in thinking of this in the post-Second World War period. Uh, what did you learn in looking at it? I know that you talked to a couple of the patients, and how did they fare? So that's a very complicated uh, story because we don't actually know for a fact that that's the same thing we're looking at now, given that no pathogen was identified. Um, you know, we don't. So there have been a number of outbreaks, a dozen or more, that look sort of similar in this well in the last century. Um, and including before the Royal Free Outbreak. Um, so we don't really know that those were all the same thing. That particular outbreak affected a couple of hundred or more, uh, mostly nurses. Um, I talked to two retired, uh, two G people who were GPs actually, um, were not nurses, but they were also women. So most of those impacted were women. Um, it was clear from those, those treating it at the time were convinced that it was an infectious uh, disease outbreak, some kind of viral infection, but they never identified any pathogen. Uh, um, and people were seemed to be having um, uh, a lot of flu-like symptoms, especially muscle weakness, and they seemed to have relapses if they went back to work too soon. So one of the people I talked to, she was patient number 234. By then they already knew, according to her, that uh, uh, those who had gone back to work uh, too soon had relapsed and gotten sick again. So they told her just to basically rest for six months. So she was on leave for six months while she rested. She never seemed to have any further min minor things, but never really seemed to have further consequences. Um, the other one did have many, it continued to remain ill um, and have continuing problems for the rest of her life. I mean, she's now in her 80s. Uh, and so, um, you know, most of the people, and there are many of them involved in that, are no longer with us. So it's hard to sort of track down, uh, to track them down. That afterwards uh, gave rise to the name myalgic encephalomyelitis, which means uh, inflammation of the brain and central nervous system with muscle pain. Uh, the question of inflammation of the brain is still, you know, open to question. It's hard to prove brain inflammation. Um, so, but that's sort of the name that sort of stuck around and was in 1969, the WHO listed it as a neurological illness. Um, when there were outbreaks in the U.S. in the 1980s, uh, especially the one that the Centers for Disease Control investigated around the Lake Tahoe area, they ended up calling it chronic fatigue syndrome because they didn't really, you know, know what it was and uh, it, they didn't really understand it and they focused on what they saw as the main symptom, which was fatigue. That name has caused a lot of problems because uh, it makes everybody think, oh, I, you know, I'm also fatigued or I have fatigue. And it's really important to say that for most patients or many patients, it's not fatigue like you work too hard today, but it's like a kind of paralytic exhaustion that they experience after they overexert themselves. And uh, that seems to be what's happening is that patients have some sort of dysfunction of they, get a, they seem to get a viral illness or some other kind of illness or it could be triggered by an uh, exposure to environmental toxins or other physiologic trauma, perhaps in some cases mold or a combination of things. They may have a genetic susceptibility because it seems to run in families and some, com some in exposure or infection or combination of things triggers this hyper inflammatory response that seems to continue after the uh, uh, initiating trigger it goes away. If it's an infection, the infection seems to go away. Um, but they're left with this consequences of having this prolonged uh, illness that seems to sort of impair their ability to produce energy. And so if they do too much, they get bad relapses. And the concept of graded exercise therapy based on a, decondi a deconditioning and 
uh, unhelpful illness beliefs model is you know contraindicated if in fact the main symptom is that you relapse after overexerting yourself. David, I think you've explained that better than anybody has ever explained it. <laughs> well, I don't know to me, that. at least, you are a hero in this community, and I think everybody who's watching this or listening to it uh, would send you their thanks and their gratitude. And thank you so much for coming on the program. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Great pleasure. Okay.